Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. I'll tell you about some basics, about some pros, cons, about uh, how to scale, about uh, some workarounds, uh, about some tricks maybe. Uh, also have a little examples for GraphQL and gRPC. I guess REST is uh, the most popular and everyone have already experienced with it and know how it looks like. Uh, but still, let's go through the basic because in almost all projects I've participated in, there are some mistakes. First of all, what is REST? REST stands to representational stand transfers. Uh, it's a software architectural style that describes a uniform interface between physical separately components. Uh, when we talk about REST, we should think about resources. Everything that can be named uh, could be resource, for example, user, post, uh, I don't know, product, category, etc. And you should think about uh, in your API like what resources and what can I do with these resources. First, we should know is resource identification. We identify resources by URL. Second one, when the resource is identified, we want to know what should we do with the resource. Then we use HTTP methods, which is get, just retrieve, collection or a specific entity, uh, post to create new one, put to uh, update, fully update, or in some cases create, idem potentially. Uh, patch to partially update, delete for deleting. There are also some other option uh, headers, sorry, methods for like header options, uh, but they're not widely used. But you may face uh, options in preflight requests for browsers. Uh, second one is we should use uh, JSON for resource state representation. Uh, because it's relatively fast and optimized and also you can, it's human readable. Then it's easy to debug. Uh, and send the status of the operation in HTTP response codes. I guess you all know like 200 uh, codes for success, 300 for network, uh, for redirections, uh, 400 for user errors and uh, 500 is for server side errors. And second, we should specify context in headers. Uh, authorization is going, I mean, authorization is yes, going through the headers. Uh, we use some types like better or basic. Basic is just, you know, password and user ID encrypted in base64 format. Uh, better is uh, GVT tokens. Uh, about versioning, that's a really interesting topic. It's huge, uh, but I guess you all face the versioning in URL. I mean, like uh, V2 in the URL, right? And you should always remember that REST is stateless. What does it mean? Everything you need to uh, perform the request should be in the specific request. Sessions is not allowed there. Uh, of course, you can uh, save uh, the state of the resources in database, but session object, as you probably saw in uh, some PHP frameworks, etc., like where you can share transfers bef uh, between calls for specific users, are not really good options there. Uh, and good way to document it, it's Swagger page. I'll not stop uh, specifically in some points because it's the most popular framework, and I guess you almost all have an experience with it. But let's talk about URLs. Uh, of course, we should use plural nouns, not verbs, because this one is about resources. Uh, the basic uh, structure for building your URLs is like collection, then identifier. And you should always remember that trailing slash is important. Uh, I suggest you in a team before starting building your API uh, have an agreement. Would you add it everywhere or you'll use a specific, for example, rule lock? Uh, if it's specific object, do not use trail and slash. If it's a collection, use trail and slash at the end because it's important for some uh, protocols like WebDAV, which suggest uh, use trail and slash at the end of collection. Collection is the set of objects. 
Uh, and of course, some frameworks like, for example, Django gives you an option to redirect user uh, if you miss a trail in slash or uh, add it for you to every uh, endpoint. But you should remember that redirections doesn't work for post, uh, doesn't work for everything except get. Also, I not suggest you really use deep nesting uh, because in most cases, that means that something goes wrong. And in most cases, uh, root URLs, root, I mean, uh, for example, if you want to get uh, attachments for a specific message, I suggest you use attachments and maybe some filters instead of do like messages, message number one, attachments. Why? Because uh, basically root URL is, uh, in most cases, can be reused. Okay. Uh, also, please remember about query parameters. Query parameters is this thing equals to something. It can be used to pagination and sorting. That is the most common case uh, for filtering. And in some cases, you should always also remember that response formatting is also allowed. What I mean, you can easily specify like fields. I wanna I wanna list there. For example, uh, name, surname, etc. And there are also a framework from Microsoft. I don't really remember the name, but it allows and describes a schema uh, configuration through these parameters. And also what should we know? As I said before, uh, use plural nouns, not verbs, but you may find such examples in huge systems. And that is right because look, user is not a plural, uh, that's everything there is a way to get a current uh, locked in user. You should remember that URL is a conceptual mapping. It's not a mapping to a specific entity, specific point of memory. Uh, this one may change. This URL may point to different objects depending on the context. For example, for different locked in users, this one would be different users, right? But it's always current locked in user. That is a concept of this URL. You may also found some magic keys like my, myself, or, and I would also suggest you to have an agreement in your team before starting building your APIs. Because sometimes these magic keywords like me or myself, you may find in many places like my photos, uh, my, uh, you know, my posts, etc. And it's really common when you have multiple developers, developers which develop in parallel and some of them use myself, others use me, etc. And this brings mass to your application. And sometimes you may find uh, an interesting situation when uh, it's not really restful actions in your API. For example, computers reboot, computers hibernate, computers shut down, all of them require specific parameters specific validation, and they are really different. Uh, the common workaround to the situation is to use actions collection, where in a body you'll specify type of the operation and each of the type can have a separate payload, I mean, different payload schema. Uh, but you should always remember if you have a lot of such operations, maybe rest is not really suitable for you and you should check about uh, using RPC. RPC is for actions. Uh, some advices maybe uh, before starting developing your API, check if you can, uh, no, just create a generic response and uh, response for an error because yes, this is really common uh, when every developer use own schema own fields, uh, and that's not really easy for front end then to use this such API. I suggest you also put status code to the payload because some frameworks really ignore status code from the HTTP headers. And also use uh, such structure like uh, object, not list, 
even for collection objects. You may easily uh, put instead of data or inside of data, for example, if you're using all users, you may still use same structure, but put like users. Why should we use this one? Because it's much easier to extend. And in such case, it's much easier to add pagination, for example. Uh, in a case like you start without pagination, then the system grows, you have uh, lots of objects, and it's not the case for now, load them all. You want to add uh, pagination. And that's still possible to extend such a point without breaking changes. Because if you'll change this uh, list, root list to root object, this will break all the old clients which still expect a list. What's next also about our generic response for errors. Uh, such a good idea to put uh, status code still. Also code enumeration, I mean code field with enumeration which uh, represents a specific action or problem. Uh, why? Because for front end it's much easier, for example, to localize your app uh, because this one it's not really easy to add localization on backend, then respond to every change because you know, uh, client says, okay, I want to change the text for this field. Front end uh, triggers you. You should add it somewhere. Uh, that is much faster just to put a code. So front end, different front end in your system, mobile apps, uh, web apps can react differently on every error. For example, you have a payment check. Uh, payment step right on your checkout and you may have different errors with same status code. So how would, uh, would front end recognize what should he do? If the error code, for example, not enough money, then front end will show, for example, localized uh, message plus redirect user to a page. You don't have uh, enough money, please uh, deposit on your card. Or for example, your card is blocked. Maybe we should, I don't know, somehow react on this situation. Okay, and something about uh, scaling app. Uh, in REST, scaling is really easy. <clears throat> uh, you can easily separate your applications. Uh, I mean, just shard some payloads uh, and split your huge service into microservices like user service, uh, like a message service. And uh, you can easily set up multiple instances for each service. And you can easily configure like if the user service is much more uh, popular, then you might need to set up four instances of the services. If messages is less popular, you can set up only two of them. Uh, also balance loading works perfectly on L4, I mean network transfer layer or application layer. It depends on your rules in the app. Uh, let's switch to yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> yeah. oh, also about file uploading, that is an interesting question because in REST format, you should put file inside your body. A uh, possible way to do this is base64 encoding for the file, but this approach increase uh, memory amount that you need to transfer the message about 20%, uh, which is not great. So I'll suggest you use, and this is really popular decision, just to use uh, <clears throat> for multi-part encoded uh, messages, just the same as you upload files through forms. Okay, let's go to GraphQL. Just, I'll better just show you how it looks like. I have an example, a little example. <clears throat> that is a simple Flask application. Uh, you'll need to install, I think, two or three libraries. First one is an integration with Flask, Flask GraphQL. Second one is an integration with uh, SQL Alchemy. <clears throat> All we have is a single endpoint and an option which gives us a uh, interface which calls graph iql let's check how it looks like and we have 
two models in the system is department and employee. Department and employee are connected <clears throat> and we have some hybrid properties like employees count. Also for debugging purpose, I set uh, echo true for SQL session just for us to see what's going on on DB level. And let's maybe remove this one key. Okay, stop and run. Uh, GraphQL in most implementations provides you also a graphic interface. Uh, GraphQL, which looks almost everywhere like this. What do we have? A field for entering our queries and also documentations which shows us each types we have in a system. Uh, three basic types in uh, GraphQL is a query, where we represent Let's start with the queries we have. Departments, which also accepts some parameters. How it looks like in a code. We have a schema object. Schema is a set of all queries and mutations in our system. And how the query looks like. Uh, as you probably remember, I said that we also have Graphi uh, SQL uh, I mean, SQL alchemy integration with GraphQL. GraphQL implementation I'm using there is a graphene, uh, which gives us a type which allows us to transfer SQ, uh, SQL alchemy objects into a uh, GraphQL object with default resolver. What does it mean? <clears throat> uh, from the models, I can easily create a type and then expose it to the API. As you can see, uh, there are, I believe, no more than 20 lines of the code, which give us full control for uh, requesting departments and employees in different configurations. All we then need is uh, to create queries from these objects and use them. Let's check an example of query. For example, I want to query all departments. I want to have only first three. Uh, and I want to add just note. Yes, we have embedded pagination there because uh, this framework, uh, I mean, Graphene, uh, with uh, integration with Flask, have an implementation of Connect um, framework. Sorry, can I have a, one question? Because uh, maybe yeah. I'm just missing something. Or so yeah. basically, once we have this uh, Flask uh, model pre present in, in some point, uh, this uh, graphene that you mentioned it's some, is some sort of uh, um, interconnector between, uh, between this model and the GraphQL itself, or there is something yeah. more? Uh, yeah, sure. is... My bad, sorry. Uh, GraphQL is a specification created by Facebook. It's just a set of rules. Uh, Graphene is an implementation, is Python implementation. Graphene okay. itself implements uh, engine for parsing queries and for calling uh, specific methods for describing uh, schema in Python objects. Okay, okay, schema fair enough. Set. Yeah. Schema is a set of queries and mutations. Mm -hmm. And oh. we can describe queries in Python objects. Uh, okay. This integration with uh, SQL Alchemy gives you an ability to generate this uh, representation, GraphQL representation from SQL Alchemy objects. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, after these few lines of code, I can query almost everything. As you can see, this one is options. If I click employee connection, which give us two fields, this one, edge edges, which is data. I can also query pagination info. Uh, for example, start cursor, end cursor, has next page, etc. And inside edges, node, employee, I can query these fields. As you might see, these fields are from 
SQL alchemy model. A good news, uh, Graphene is also integrated with Django and Django ORM. So Django models will still work with in such way. And I would say Django is better integrated with Graphene because op more optimized. Okay, let's check what we have, for example, name. And I may also query all the employees because employees are connected through DB. This department, note and name, for example. You see what we have now? We have a marketing department and we have employees inside these marketing departments. That is really comfortable for front-end developers. Also good news for front-end developers, we expose a file with a schema, which front-end guys can fetch and then automatically build types for front-end. Just JS classes with uh, some validations, uh, type checking, etc. Also good point that this one gives us typing. So on backend side, we just specify which fields we expect to have and what response we may give to the front-end. Okay, as you can see, but let's see, you know, why can this be uh, really useful for you? Imagine like a situation you have an object like, I don't know, product, right? And you have a set of fields and someday front end comes to you and say, okay, I need, uh, now you have two options. Uh, set all the fields into singular endpoint which may lead to, you know, network bandwidth problems because lots of uh, data, especially when we talk about mobile connection because mobile internet may be slow and it's much more efficient to send only data that is needed on the business. On the front end, front end don't need to ping you and ask like, please change me a set of fields like we have in the rest, right? Uh, he can just query another fields if he need, like age, for example, and call the query, etc. I'm sorry. Could you please maybe disable your, your camera because the, the quality of the connection is pretty bad? About Flask implementation. Let me clear. Vyacheslav, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and we have connection in or mobile. Uh, we just uh, yes. we have can one more me? question. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we thanks. have one question in our chat. Uh, how can we implement pagination in GraphQL? Uh, pagination. There are multiple ways uh, that is not specified uh, in GraphQL specification, but uh, in multiple, for example, in Graphene. Uh, you may found some predefined pagination. That is an example. Uh, and cursor, star cursor has next page, next page. As you can see, I queried only first three of departments, but I have more. Uh, what else can I do? Edges have also cursor. Let me go back. Cursor is a string. Okay. In query cursor. Uh, cursor, uh, what should you know about cursor, about this pagination? Uh, cursor is the last uh, queried field. Cursor is a uh, base64 encoded uh, type name plus ID plus uh, certain fields. And you can just put this keyword in after parameter and now you get next three objects they remember it was administration or no, it was marketing before now it's administration that is pagination and you still have more you can put it there Engineering, you still have more. It's 
still have more. Uh, wait a second. Base 64 decode. And yes, in such pagination, you always should have an ordering. Uh, but in this implementation, I mean, Ah, uh, looks like I have some network. Now all IDs in the system are basically type name plus ID of the object. Uh, this one is important because you may find such interesting query which are generated automatically. Yeah, you see, node. This one gives us an ability to query every object in our system like this, node. Uh, node implements, uh, wait a second, let's put ID. And before the ID, I need some existing ID. This one, let's this one. Uh, ID like this. Now I can query a specific object. So you shouldn't implement it by yourself, which uh, can really speed up your development. But you may find that node interface implements only single field uh, ID. How can we query everything else? If you click to node, you'll find that there are different implementations, employee and department. And we can use inline fragments on, for example, department and query all fields we need. Yeah, now we have name. So good point for you. Uh, if you have DB CRUD, you can implement it in basically a few minutes just with this SQL Alchemy integration. Same for Django. Uh, you'll be able to query a list of objects, a specific object, uh, but it's a little bit more harder with uh, actions with these entities. Uh, for actions, we need to create mutations. But again, uh, let me switch back to a specific point I want to share with you. Uh, can you hear me right? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, let's talk about performance. Uh, as you see, I'm querying departments. In departments, I'm querying, for example, employee names. An example of such query. The result of such query, you see human resources have multiple employees. And what queries do we have to the DB? Look, first one, Second one, third one, fifth one, and one for uh, querying amount of. Uh, what's going on? Basically, we querying first of all departments, and then for each department, we query in a separate DB query uh, all employees, which is not really efficient, right? And this may lead to really bad performance issue. How can we fix that? On Django, we may install a third party package, which will allow us to specify which fields should you prefetch. Uh, on SQL Alchemy, we may just set lazy joint option just to prefetch all the data. Let's check if something changes. Let's run the same query. How much query we have now? As you can see, much less. One and two, which is generic one. So we, as you can see, we use joint expression and query employees and departments as the same query. Uh, but you may find an interesting point. Wait a second. Yeah, as you can see, we query all the fields on employee 
its name, it's hired on, its department ID, its age, but in GraphQL schema, we only want to see a name. Uh, Django implementations give more optimized, uh, performs more optimized way. And if you want to query only name, it will query from DB only name, which is faster. Uh, also, there are problem with hybrid options. For example, if you have a query, uh, for example, I don't know, count, right? You want to count how much employees you have in such department. It will still be implemented for each department uh, individually. So you'll have n plus one problem. Uh, as I remember, Django have a solution for such problem. Uh, SQL Alchemy, uh, SQL Alchemy with Flask, not really, uh, which leads to bad performance. If you have a simple queries, that's a perfect solution for you. If not, then you have some troubles. Uh, a way to optimize it. Uh, GraphQL and Facebook also implemented such a framework like data loaders. What is data loader? Uh, data loader is a simple object uh, in which you can try to load something and this object will automatically batch these queries. An example of such query, uh, for example, on this level, I wanna get employees, this one, field. Yeah, still young employees loader, which is SQL query, which counts all the employees is under 15 years old. How it's implemented. As I said before, if I'll just add a specific uh, hybrid option to uh, model site, it will query n plus one. But data loader framework, wait a second, it's in, yep, data loader. Uh, what is done? It just queries every employees for a specific department. Uh, where employees under 15 years old by a list of IDs. Then this list of IDs are mapped to original calls. How original calls looks like? Yep. You see a department query and we have a, a resolver which resolves this field. Still young employees loader, we found the same one. Still young complete loader. And it calls this object uh, to load employees count for a specific department, right? Uh, what is going on under the hood? Uh, in a single query, I mean, in single scope of GraphQL query, we have three departments, right? This method will be called three times. We collect all three IDs of departments we need to query. And then inside we query uh, in a single query, all three departments information. And then we just return this information back. And you may find this one is much more optimized because we have not n plus one calls, but only one additional. Uh, we may also apply caching there, client side caching. <coughs> oh, sorry, server side caching. Uh, about maybe pros and cons. Uh, also, uh, there are also uh, mutations, mutations, sorry. What mutations is? Mutation is also a GraphQL object which can be described in Python. Uh, you can specify arguments for this. Uh, we may say function and response type. As you see, this create department mutation uh, requires us to put a name and may return as department. This department still may be filtered on a front-end side and I show this. Uh, what's inside is just uh, a creation of new department. And we should return the same object as we described before. This department implemented. Let's check how it looks like. How it's called. 
we use grade department in mutation like grade department query okay let's then write mutation so grade department and put a parameter as you see this is name and maybe you know my test as a response we have department and department have the same fields as you saw before all departments and connection no department name name and maybe employees count yeah i can also query employees employees count next execute new object added we can check it in query all departments I just note name yeah my test department said it uh, what about versioning uh, basically GraphQL suggests you not to create a separate version of the API but just uh, evolve the schema because every client just query a field which is needed to him right so we can just keep old fields and add new ones the only problem you may face is when the type of the field changes because this one is really breaking change on this case you may create a separate schema v2 and separate v2 endpoint as i said on flask level it's just a single endpoint you may create v2 GraphQL version uh, with uh, different schemas, if you want. Another good uh, thing GraphQL and Graphene may do for you is uh, subscriptions. Uh, basically, what subscription is, uh, Graphene also may open a WebSocket connection and you may subscribe for some updates and inside server may like uh, push some messages to the topic and all the clients subscribe to this topic will receive this message uh, i don't have an example because this requires a little bit more work for me so but if you want you may read the documentation which is really good for graphene uh, okay as I said, we have some troubles with performance and it might be a little bit complicated to create a simple uh, APIs with GraphQL, but I may prove you that there are really huge projects which exist uh, on GraphQL, which is Sailor. Sailor is an open source, open source. you can just uh, upload this one, uh, e-commerce project where you have uh, just a store with different products, categories, collections, gift cards, there are lots of uh, everything implemented. And you may find GraphQL API, where you may just, you know, train a little or check uh, best practices because this is really good product. Uh, you may find also subscription, everything you need you still have documentation objects, descriptions of all types. So if you wanna open source uh, store product, you may use a seller. Uh, it's written on Django, it adds additional packages like also Django integration with Graphene, uh, Django RAM integration with Graphene, uh, you may also need to install optimization package, which allows you to prefetch some data on requests, uh, just to optimize and avoid performance issues and have a really nice API with GraphQL. Okay, what is the problem with GraphQL? Uh, let's think about such situation. See note, this is department, right? Department connected with employees. 
employees address note connected with department department again connected with employees and again employee connected with department and that is a perfect way to dedose your site uh, a very deeply nested query especially if you have multiple departments and multiple employees inside your departments may really break the system okay let's go back note name oh wait a second Department. Okay, that's just department name. As you can see, it's still valid query. You may nest as much as you want. Employees, edges, uh, node, name. This will take a while. And you should know that this one performed on your server. Then no one else, if you have only one worker, not be able to connect the system while I'm loading. And you can just imagine what will we have if I'll just copy this one and nest three times. Oh, yeah, we're done. Uh, how to protect us from such situation? By default, uh, Graphene has an option to restrict uh, level of nesting. For example, you may nest no more than uh, three uh, levels, right? Like first one. Uh, department, second employees, and third one, again, department, which is maybe okay for you. But there are also more extended form, which you may found on seller, uh, called query cost analysis. How does it work? You just assign to each field, uh, for example, name field, uh, cost of execution. Name is a simple one to execute. Employees, it's much harder to execute, right? Because we need a joining query. And you specify multipliers. Multipliers, for example, first five. First five. And you'll just multiply the score of the object. Score of the object is a score of all the fields, nested fields, to this multiplier and get a query cost. Then you can just analyze which maximum query cost you may allow your clients to query from your endpoint. And this one protect you from deep nesting, from querying lots of resources, because I can query first five or first 1,000 or 10,000, etc. cetera. Uh, and I really appreciate you to add this query cost analysis because this may save your application from the DOS because GraphQL is much uh, easier to the DOS than REST APIs because uh, REST is, uh, again, maybe protected. Uh, REST is maybe split to multi-services and also REST is fixed schema. So you always know how much time it will uh, cost you to calculate, for example, single post and return to user. With GraphQL, you are not really aware what will be going with your API. Uh, yes, also about file uploading. It's not specified in GraphQL and not implemented in Graphene, but uh, Graphene suggests you a third party library again uh, for file uploading, which do it uh, through the same as uh, REST APIs, through multi, uh, through the form encoded uh, files. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Oh, about caching. Uh, it's easy to implement server-side caching. I mean, just with Redis, for example, or specifically cache specific fields, but it's not a, a really possible with network caching. Some tools like uh, Cloudflare or different CDN gives you an ability to uh, cache all the data uh, without hitting your server. This one is good but not available for GraphQL. Why? Because uh, you know, in GraphQL you may have uh, different schemas 
and you may not, for example, you can cache name for department, but you can't cache employees for department because it's critical. Uh, there are some specific tools which allows to parse uh, these queries and cache specific fields, but it's complicated. And as I remember, there are no really uh, production ready tools for such caching. So the only available method is client side and server side caching. Client side is implemented in Apollo client for front end. This is JavaScript, the GraphQL client, which allows you to you know, just execute queries and parse results. Also an obvious error handling. Uh, why? Because GraphQL always returns you 200 response code. Uh, what you'll see on error is just uh, another keyboard, root keyboard calls errors. Uh, what maybe I'll demonstrate mutation, great department, name, for example, name is a single, sorry. Okay, department, name. Uh, name with a single character is not allowed. You may see my mutation. If the land is less than four, we'll throw an error. The name is too short. And let's inspect network. Executing the query, as you can see, response code is 200. But inside the response, you have errors object, which is not really good way of representing errors because uh, many systems rely on this state. Many monitoring system relies on this state. Many health check relies on this state. Uh, so you should know this uh, feature of the GraphQL and always parse uh, response and check if the errors inside. Is, um, there, any, is there any way to somehow override this uh, uh, status code to be for uh, 400 or whatever, or, or 500 or whatever? Uh, basically, it's not a popular decision. Of course, you can do everything because you have a source code. <laughs> uh, that's not a good way. In most integrated tools like Apollo Client, uh, error handling are already out of the box. Okay. Uh, what can you overwrite? You can basically catch my, uh, most errors and, and specify, for example, your custom generic type of the error message. Because this one might be not really appropriate for you. You know, message and locations and paths where the problem exists, appears. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, and also possible case for GraphQL is just like a proxy object which allows you to query data from multiple uh, microservices. Like you have four REST microservices and a single entry point, uh, GraphQL entry point, which just queries information from these microservices. Client will query you, you will query these microservices. This allows you to, you know, to communicate with only one source of uh, information for front end. Also, as I said, uh, devices with uh, network issues like mobile devices with slow internet uh, are not damaged by this approach. Why? Because you probably will uh, deploy all your microservices in GraphQL in a network which have I think, 10 gigabytes uh, internet. 10 gigabits internet, which is really fast to fetch. So that is not a problem for the end clients. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Okay, we don't have much time. Okay, let's move to graph to gRPC. Uh, sorry, I may not stop on some maybe interesting points, but uh, huge topics and I want to just overview all of them so you to know which one you may use and then dig in and face if it's appropriate or not for you. Oh, wait a second, file open address. Let's see. This window. <clears throat> okay. 
what gRPC is about. GraphQL pros and cons. It's easy to DDoS, as I saw, as I shown before. Uh, error handling. It's not obvious because we always have 200 error code. Network caching issues, performance issues, because as you said, N plus one problem. Uh, and also we exposing schema. As I said, you might protect some methods, right? For example, menu may be allowed for only, I don't know, uh, premium customers, right? But everyone will see that you really have this query menu, which gives some you know, space to hackers to inspect your internal system and know which uh, structure you have. Okay, the possible way also to create separate schema for admin users, for example, and expose it only for authorized users. Uh, let's back, let's back, let's back. Yep, let's switch to gRPC. <laughs> uh, gRPC is a Google implementation of RPC, which built on top of HTTP2. HTTP2 have uh, interesting features like data compression of HTTP headers, uh, multiplexing of multiple requests over a single TCP connection. Traditionally, traditionally what we have, uh, if we want to fetch some data in parallel, we just set up uh, multiple connections. Uh, in HTTP2, you can do this with a single connection. It's some kind of, uh, I don't know, async IO, asynchronous frameworks when uh, you use the full power of a single connection. Also streaming with multiplexing. Uh, basic idea also show. Um, we describe, first of all, we describe our system in protofile. Protofile have specific syntax, specific rules where you can describe messages and services. Message is just a data type like page pagination, have optional in uh, page, per page option and page number. Uh, list, you can nest some objects inside others. And what should you know? These numbers are not default values. This number just identify a field uh, during encoding and decoding. This is binary. Uh, GraphQL encode everything in binary format. And this one needed to encode and decode. What should you know? You shouldn't reuse this number. If you, for example, decide to remove this field. It's not okay just to remove this one and add, for example, I don't know, string number three. Because if there are any client which expects an old structure and you will put it like this, for example, this will bring an error because you know uh, all clients expect integer on the first field but you have string then by it's shifting and you have invalidly decoded message uh, what should you do always use new number you should remember that uh, small numbers uh, that use only one bit is much faster so use this one for frequently uh, requested fields also if you completely delete some field please uh, reserve it this one just said, please don't use number one. Number one was used in previous implementations. Uh, do not reuse. Okay. <clears throat> we can have enumerations. Uh, you can specify some configurations through option. Uh, option. This might be language specific options, for example, for Java, how to generate classes, etc. And then you can specify services. Service is just a set of uh, RPC methods. As you remember, in REST, we think in objects, how to manipulate objects. In RPC, we think uh, in functions. What can we do? We can list customers, we can read uh, CSV chunk, etc. Uh, where we specify incoming and response type. Uh, the great thing about gRPC is automatic code generation. Uh, in 
one command, you can generate uh, Python or Java or C++ or Go, Lang or Node.js classes. And it's not required. And yes, uh, gRPC is a client server architecture. So you have a dedicated client, dedicated server. Dedicated client can be written on Golang and client can be written on Python. Uh, what I mean in generation? In a single comment, uh, comment like, I don't remember if it's over there, wait a second. Yeah, like this. Uh, you can compile this proto file and generate Python classes uh, for server and for client. <coughs> How it looks like, these two files are generated by this uh, protobuf compiler. This doesn't really make any sense to us to read it or edit. It's also asked, please do not edit. Same for server implementation. Uh, what do we have there? How to create our server? We just import from this uh, gRPC uh, generated file servicer. It's always servicer at the end. Uh, the first part is taken from the name of the service in part above. Then all we should we do is inherit our service, our Python implementation from the service and implement methods specified there, list customers, list customers which accept request and context. And return type specified also there. And that is request. Uh, these two types are stored in this file without slash gRPC underscore gRPC. <coughs> uh, as you can see, uh, all this stuff doing is just returning customers with pagination. Customers are pre-generated. And also, let's maybe start and check. Okay, server started. Let's uh, Python. Oh, yeah, Python client implementation. You should also import for now stop object. Stop is a uh, why stop? Because we don't really have to implement client. All client do is just query server site logic and return you a result. There are nothing you should implement by yourself. Server you should implement because you have a certain logic for each of this method. Client shouldn't be implemented. Uh, from the client, you can just set up a connection. Channel is a connection. It can be uh, HTTPS, I mean, secured connection or not secured. Uh, you can add some notification authorization to this channel, then initialize this tab with the channel, and then you can use it, just client and name of the method. You see, list customers, list customers. And put the same as specified here, list customer request. List customer request is all required information. Uh, let's run this example. Python. Client apply. <laughs> you see, you have 30 objects returned. Uh, we may print them, for example. Yeah, as you can see, just a client with age and name. Uh, as you can see, customer have name and age fields. Okay, okay. A good thing about gRPC is also ability to stream request and you may also... Stream response. What does it give you? Uh, gRPC will hold connection, long life collection and uh, send multiple responses in this case because we stream in response. Um, multiple responses to, through the single connection. This is really a uh, optimized way because setup connection takes a lot of action and uh, lots of time basically, because you have handshakes, uh, you have uh, pre-flight requests, etc. 
a lot of actions should be done. If you keep a single connection, that is like keep a single DB connection. You may also know that it's much better to reuse DB connections than create a new one for each request. Uh, same there. An example of client, how does it work? Let's this. You see, if in the previous case uh, from these customers, we just get in result, result like this, a list of customers, oh, wait a second, response, response, customers list, basically. On this case, we get an iterable object results, which we may iterate through and the server will send us this result as far as this result appears on the server. Uh, the server implementation of this. Um, on this example, like image, we have a huge file, which is not really, uh, which we're not able to load on our uh, RAM memory, because for example, this file is, I don't know, 100 gigabytes. <laughs> you may send this file in chunks with streaming, just read partially and send to the client. In this case, we sleep one second and then send next. Uh, um, I have next, a question. Next, next. Yeah. I have a and question it. here. Yeah. Uh, is it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, pretty much quite sure that for the sake of this uh, presentation, you use the iterator here. But uh, as far as I remember, what once I was working with this one, is it not worth to use a generator here instead of iterator, just to for the sake of. Um, uh memory memory efficiency uh, just for this no, this uh, one uh, uh, yes one this seven. one is generator sorry <laughs> this one is generator i mean oh, it's okay. Iterate, oh, okay. iteratable okay. yes okay. okay because as i said before uh you will loop uh each every loop will be next one second you'll see an example just like okay that's nice. It's not possible with iterator because you know iterator is fully built before using, but yeah, generator, yeah, that's, that's yes. Okay, okay, nice. So it's this yeah. results uh, uh, results variable is uh, a generator object, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Right. And let me load the client again. You'll see one second new data, one second new data, one second new data. That is generator. And as you may see, you just keep a single connection and each one second you get in new data. Uh, yes, this is memory efficient. As I said, if the file is really huge, it's not uh, really possible to load it to the, your RAM memory. That is why we can't use iterator. Same for incoming request. You can basically stream request and in streaming request, you will have iter uh, generator for the request. You may also uh, iterate through the generator and accept new uh, data from the client. Uh, this one is great, but this one is not fully substitution of web uh, socket technology. But yes, in some cases, you may use something like this. Uh, and you should remember this one is TCP, then you have a guarantee of uh, all the packages will be delivered, but it's slower than UDP protocol. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> yeah, something I want to share with you about gRPC. Mm. A good point, uh, as I said, you have a connection and channel and multiplexing. So single connection can be used uh, at most efficient way. So you load the full connection stream and all the data is like partially uh, separated, not in multiple ways, but just dropped in a single packages and put to the single stream one by one. Uh, to be able to stream or send such multiplexing, you should keep a long living connection. Uh, if you have an actively used connection, that's okay. It will always be uh, active and connected. But if you have some pauses in using your service, uh, you may need to use Keep Alive pings. Keep Alive pings will just, uh, for example, each 10 seconds ping your endpoints and check if connected is set up. Why? Because as I said before, 
uh, yes, uh, gRPC have automatic uh, connection recovery, but this will take some time to set up this connection. It's much better to keep this connection always on. Also, uh, streaming RPC is most more efficient way uh, of sharing data. So if you can use streaming RPC, then use streaming. Uh, but what should you know? <clears throat> what should you know about streaming? In Python, it's not such efficient and uh, streaming RPC much slower than Unreal RPC because uh, it um, creates an extra thread to operate these connections. Uh, that Python is the only language where streaming is slower than uh, single Unreal operation. Uh, so you may need to create, for example, service in, I don't know, Java C or C++ language uh, and use Python client, which is okay. Uh, what else? Uh, you should also try to reuse this channel object. If it's connected, you can use it in a, do not close it from request to request. Try to keep it as long as possible and close at the end of the session. Uh, and what can I advise you? As I said, we just use a single connection for multiple, even parallel calls, right? Uh, we can have a queue uh, overflow situation when you have a really loaded uh, resource, like you have, I don't know, this method is really multiple calls. Uh, you may face a queue problem, and that is possible to. <clears throat> the first advice, if you have multiple loaded resources, please use separate connection for each resources, just uh, for them to not uh, interrupt each other. Uh, in the case you need a load balancing, this one a problem. RESTful is easy to load balance uh, in multiple levels. Uh, I mean, in transport layer, in application layer, etc. With GraphQL, it doesn't really work. Network, I mean, uh, transport uh, layer load balancing only client side balancing or uh, application level balancing. I mean, the last uh, seven level of OCI model. Uh, why? Because gRPC uses HTTP2, which is supposed to use a single connection to a single endpoint and multiplex multiple requests into single connection. Uh, network load balancers are not able to achieve such situation. Uh, in client side, what does it mean client side uh, load balancing? You can just create a pool of connections, pool of connections, pool of channels. And just uh, in some strategy like round robin, first use first channel to query, second channel, third channel, etc., <clears throat> to load balancing. Because GraphQL is really fast about transferring some data through the network. But it doesn't mean that internal implementation of these methods are also really fast. This is regular Python. This is regular Python uh, speed of the execution. So you may need to set up multiple instances to deal with such load. Uh, also, yeah, Python have some special unary uh, thread, single thread unary stream, which may be more efficient uh, than a standard implementation, but it's uh, not, it's experimental feature. So be ready to face some troubles with it. And I would suggest you, what's the problem with gRPC? Of course, it's really fast, it has a streaming, uh, it's powerful technology, but it doesn't really have an implementation for front-end, at least official. So you can't use it from your browser as a client. <clears throat> That's not appropriate to build it in, in your React app or you know, Angular app. Um, gRPC is mostly built uh, by Google to communicate uh, in microservices because it's really fast. Op optimized, so you can build multiple microservices and set up communication between them through gRPC. Uh, REST and GraphQL is mostly for client communication. But yes, uh, you can also use them to, for machine-to-machine -machine communication, to microservices communication, etc. And 
that's all from my side, I think. Maybe you have any questions or, ah, yeah, also important thing, uh, you set up uh, multiple workers for gRPC. gRPC is basically a server. You, you just bind a specific port, you set up some workers, and this workers serve this at this port, request at this port. Mm, I have a question. Yeah. Do you maybe have any questions? Yes, I have. Suggestions? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. What, just one moment about error handling. Uh, see my C. These types uh, can really throw an error on this method. But how to handle them? You have details and code methods. Uh, codes is predefined in Google side in protobuf. Uh, you cannot specify your own error code, but you can use a record specify, specified by Google. Uh, an example of these codes in gRPC status code, for example, invalid argument, or you may found unimplemented, aborted, canceled, etc. So you may use some of them. And they are not equal to HTTP codes. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, in for example, for example, I mean, that is not 200, 400, 500 error codes. Uh, these error codes encoded into integer, but not uh, the same as in uh, HTTP. Yeah. Uh, sorry for interruption. Uh, what a question do you have? Yes, I have a question. What are the kind of business that gRPC fits the best? So what are the best use cases to, to implement uh, a, a API in that way? Uh, gRPC is not for client communication with browsers. gRPC is for machine to machine communications. It's for microservices. In okay. most cases, I saw gRPC in a system which have multiple uh, microservices, uh, and it's really great because of streaming. Uh, it's great to uh, send lots of data uh, to chunk or batch processing because as we saw in example, I can so read, for example, single file and send it part by part. So client can easily process uh, only, I don't know, 100 row instead of billion rows. At the same time. Uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, also, one point uh, gRPC also supports inter process communication. I mean, uh, you know, you can set up a pipe between different processes uh, in on the same machine, of course, and just communicate. And this way of communicating is much faster than a network. So if you have a uh, different uh, server client on the same machine, you can communicate through the process pipe instead of network. Yeah, anything else you may wanna ask? No? Can you hear me? Um, yes, so, yes. Okay. Can, can, can I have one more question? Maybe uh, it's yeah. not about this, this gRPC, but uh, um, I uh, wanted to ask about this business case for the GraphQL, because you mentioned that um, the good example is uh, a sort of open source store, as far as I understood. Uh, did, did you have a chance to work in some project, uh, maybe from some other uh, from some other uh, aspect or from some other um, uh, use case where this uh, GraphQL might be used. Because uh, honestly, from what I understood from uh, what you said, uh, it's really nice uh, kind of uh, out of the box solution to do some POX uh, in the end. But um, I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering uh, if there are any like commercial usages, like big as yeah, beside the this Facebook uh, example, 
where this GraphQL is actually used and is a better solution that than the um, like a standard or old fashioned uh, REST API. Uh, yep. Uh, also, good point. Uh, both gRPC and GraphQL supports asynchronous uh, implementation, and gRPC for Python really advised you to use asyncio because this might speed up uh, execution inside the server. And gRPC also allows you to do uh, non-blocking operations. Uh, about uh, GraphQL, uh, yes, as I said, uh, this uh, store, seller store, is an example of a uh, big production product which uses uh, GraphQL. And uh, I mostly used uh, this one in my career uh, with Django. And I think Django is better for GraphQL. Uh, you should think about, you now it's up to you. On the designing level, on the architecture creating level, you should think, do you need uh, GraphQL or REST? Because if you really have the same entity, uh, which used in multiple places with different fields, and you have a really huge entity like you know, product with, for example, 1,000 or 100 different fields, some of them are calculated. I mean, require some compute uh, consuming operations to calculate, for example, I don't know, rating to calculate uh, recommendation, etc. And it's not appropriate to send them all. REST can only send them all. Uh, in GraphQL way, you can specify which fields you need in specific case. And you can, uh, account, according to this, uh, only calculate fields that is needed. That is uh, just optimization. Also, it gives you front-end ability, you know, to manipulate your objects as he want without really pinging you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so yeah. we would talk about, uh, let's assume a situation where client asks me uh, from the perspective of uh, what uh, what solution should be used uh, in in particular case. Uh, so you 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 are saying that uh, this can be used as uh, uh, the the most uh, uh, the, the biggest advantage of uh, uh, graphql versus this uh, rest approach so basically um, this uh, possibility of having uh, like i'd say on air possibility of creating uh, or using the uh, attributes of the uh, of the models uh, that's that's correct or did I miss something? Yes, but in Django implementation, <laughs> because as you saw, as I showed you, uh, Flask is not really good option there. Uh, yes, and you should also remember that uh, GraphQL also implements subscriptions, uh, subscriptions and webhook. Uh, we may also maybe found them. Uh, as far as I remember, uh, Django in version four. Uh, also uh, delivers something like this, but I mean this WebSocket connection out of the box because uh, it- uh, Yeah, WebSocket out of the box and subscription yeah. to, you know, we don't set up uh, multiple WebSockets to multiple objects. It's not like, you know, one WebSocket connection per uh, subscription. This is uh -huh. single subscription to one WebSocket uh, which is much better for uh, you know, mobile devices to not uh, keep oh, multiple. Oh, okay, 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 that's nice, okay. Uh, also, hmm. basically that really depends on the situation. If you also wanna have some microservices, GraphQL is not really good for microserv for each microservice, each, uh, this is overcomplicated way to build microservices rest is much better because in rest you have only you know, in micro in rest microservice you won't probably have multiple types of uh, formats for single request it's really uh, low couplet and high cohesion so you have a, only single responsibility and i don't think you need such uh, uh, configurations uh, from querying as you have on graphql yeah, GraphQL is basically built it for browser clients. That's definitely uh, browser clients. And you may found that, for example, in my example, I define it my fields in Python way with underscore, right? Uh, let's switch. 
of our example, this window terminate. Yeah, uh, check my models, underscore, right? Check my schema, uh, underscore, right? I'm using Python native uh, way to define variables. But what you'll see on the GraphQL level, GraphQL console, And a second, uh, all employees, you see? Yeah. Camel case. Mm -hmm. This one is basically used for front end uh, natively. And in current project with REST API, we have a problem that front end needs to translate our uh, underscore variables, our underscore fields to such fields. Yeah, yeah, this is a huge problem. I also encountered such such one. So yeah, that, that that is a really cool thing actually that it does it like in, in the background. So everything is ready like out of the box. That's really nice. But you can disable it if you want. But yes, it two way uh transferring I mean from front end to Python and from Python to front end. So all of you using native way to define variables. And you know, front end have some uh, short cases like to put variables into object with just a name of the field. But if they need to translate this, I mean, like, you know, they can like create an object like this, which equals to, I'm sorry, which equals to, you know, this one is a name of the field in a dictionary in Python, and this one is variable. Uh, this one shortcut is actively used on front end, but if we have translation of the field, they will need to create it like this. Uh, you see, this one is not much comfortable for a front end. They wanna just send in camel case. Mm, okay. So basically, I'll recommend you use a GraphQL if the project is not really small, because GraphQL is our complicated tool for small APIs. And uh, for communication, especially with browser or maybe mobile app. Uh, REST API is much more useful in uh, microservices, and, but also can be used for client-side communication with browser or mobile phone. Do you maybe have any more questions? <laughs> Am I still online? <laughs> Can you hear me right? Yes, yes. Okay. Mm, so I think uh, no. Okay, just to summarize, uh, REST APIs for uh, multi for microservices architecture, for clients, for uh, web APIs, uh, for browsers, for mobiles. Uh, GraphQL is might be better for uh, browser and mobile communications, more optimal optimized and also should be used when you have a network, a slow network, because we reduce amount of data transfers through the network. Uh, also, additionally, we have a built-in subscriptions model, uh, which set up single web socket. Uh, gRPC is really great for high performance uh, microservices, but it's more complex. Uh, it's complicated to build uh, gRPC uh, over REST because you know you should uh, specify types uh, because there are different types for integer int 32 and int 64, uh, and you know you should plan it before you'll use. Uh, also, it's harder to maintain uh, gRPC because you need to remember that uh, some fields can't be reused. Uh, some types are compatible, sometimes are not. For example, you can use initially int 64 and then uh, change it to int 32. It's okay, 
but not in opposite way because you'll have a problem with uh, integer flow. Uh, and so use gRPC when you really need a fast uh, connection, fast data uh, communication, or you wanna transfer huge files. Because as I said, with CSV files that are generated on flight, you may, for example, upload files, uh, images, uh, batching them, etc. <clears throat> okay, if there are no more questions, we can maybe finish, right? Of course, Vyacheslav, say 